Ray Rappaport got a PhD from the University of Chicago. This is the stronghold of the efficient market hypothesis. But he will explain to us where to find good returns in the financial market, in some areas of the markets where many investors don't think of the electronic lending platforms. After the PhD, Abi was working for the board of UBS for three years, but then he decided it's a little boring to, to do something else, so he decided to set up his own fund, this Rappaport flagship limited, and let's see how well the ship is sailing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thorsten, again, for inviting us. Uh, it's a wonderful venue. Let me jump straight in. Uh, a little bit about legal disclaimers, and officially this is just for your information. This may not be construed as investment advice uh, or any solicitation to buy any shares in any security. A little bit of background to repeat, Dr. Avi Rappaport. Uh, born in Israel, lived five years in Chicago, three years now in Zurich, PhD in finance and economics, University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and Department of Economics. I had the uh, great, great fortune and honor to have Eugene Fama and Lars Hansen on my thesis committee. Actually, a quarter before my defense, they won the prize. The Nobel Prize, I saw. Uh, Gene Fama in the elevator, maybe a few days after he won the prize, everyone was still shocked. And you know how PhD students are, they don't always are very talkative with their advisors, but so I asked him in the elevator, Gene, how do you feel? You won the prize. He's like, oh, fuck it, I have to go to Stockholm now. <laughs> this is how he reacted. So this man is made out of different things from a different generation. His work ethic is just out of this world. God bless him. Bachelor uh, in Economics and Management from the Tel Aviv University. I did serve as financial advisor to Axel Weber, chairman of the board of directors at UBS. I uh, now uh, teach a new course at the University of Zurich called Money Banking. A little bit about the investment philosophy of the fund. I don't want to spend too much time on this, so please let me go uh, be brief. So the investment objective is to achieve uh, a high return of 10 to 15 percent annually by investing into baskets of very diverse assets, both liquid and illiquid, and incurring a moderate amount of leverage. The asset allocation and overall risk level is set such that under a stress test, uh, a severe recession, assuming a severe recession, uh, the realized return would be no worse than minus 10 or 20 percent. Of course, the stress test is subjective. Nothing is objective in finance, other than fees. <laughs> the strict counterparty risk management process is in place and it limits the exposure to any one bank, broker, exchange, or crowdfunding investment platform. You live and learn by the hard way. Some of the illiquid assets are under-recognized, under-invested, are offering very high returns. Yet they are very diversified over many issues and so provide a steady stream of what can only be judged as excessive returns. Again, this is my personal opinion. Feel free to have a different opinion. Some of the assets are uh, bespoke investment opportunities. Let's not talk too much about this for now. Uh, the fund only invests in book of diversified issues, i.e. no stock picking and no frequent market time. The fund is passive in the sense that no active picking of single issues is undertaken, and no frequent market timing position changes are undertaken. On rare occasion, uh, I may enter positions in shares at the pre-IPO stage or place equity debt convertible investments privately. Let's skip this now for a second. The fund is active in the sense that manager judgment is exerted when deciding the allocation to the different asset classes, in particular the crowdfunded asset classes, Fund is active in the sense that the allocation to each asset class can change over time as the perceived expected return over the coming years changes and as new asset classes become available to the manager. I invest in pretty much everything under the roof. Uh, 
the funding that it has to denominate various currencies, namely the US dollar, euro, pound, and also assets denominated in Bitcoin. Tightest cost control achieved by equivalent negotiations with all third parties. Crowdfunding. So we're going to focus today about just the crowdfunding uh, assets. People say there's a crowdfunding revolution going on. But I put in quotation marks uh, because uh, uh, because uh, there's absolutely nothing new about the underlying business practices. Okay, for example, personal loans, they've been around since forever. Now this is a joke, so feel free to laugh or to giggle or to not. Uh, I think it was Aaron the priest who wrote the first loan agreement template while his brother Moses was up on Mount Sinai chiseling the Ten Commandments into stone. Anyone is a, is a fan of the Old, of the old Testament? <laughs> Assets which were previously available only to banks, small private lenders, and wealthy families are now available to the public. What makes it different is that assets which in the past would have been financed in whole by a lender who had almost exclusive access are now being financed online by many crowd financiers. So again, slicing up financial assets and assigning economic and legal ownership to different investors is nothing new in finance either. So there's absolutely nothing revolutionary or new to justify the word fintech, other than, of course, the technology underlying the blockchain ledger. Of course, that is financial technology and a wonderful innovation, probably the greatest monetary invention since the adoption of gold, in my opinion. Okay, so let's go ask some advice. Any questions so far, please? Uh, let's go to the first asset class that's being mediated online. Uh, this is the biggest asset class by far, which you can get exposure to. Uh, personal unsecured loans. So what's personal unsecured? Personal unsecured is the biggest asset class being crowdfunded online. Lending Club is by far the biggest originator, mediating $1 billion of loans per month. Mediating is not to use the word intermediating because uh, because of the technicality of it uh, being passed on to investors as is, as opposed to taking on credit risk with, with the platform. Even though Lending Club, in this case, has a very particular model wherein investors do have uh, direct exposure to, to the platform operator. So personal unsecured means that the borrower is a person as opposed to a legal entity. Unsecured means that there are no specific assets being pledged as security against the loan. Okay, personal unsecured is the oldest, is the oldest asset in the book, is oldest finance. A little bit about the underwriting. Uh, personal details are collected from each borrower, location, age, sex, marital status, education, employment, work experience, house ownership, loan details are being collected. The, the, the purpose of the loan mostly is for loan consolidation, so people are refinancing other loans that they're getting at a higher rate, sometimes at a lower rate. Finance some property, a redecoration of their house, business, education, travel, buy a little car, health expense or other. Income verification, this is important. Uh, people uh, have to upload uh, their uh, uh, income statements and this gets verified. Most times uh, they can have salary income, pension income, child benefits, social benefits, parental leave alimony or other income, uh, expense verification, that's also part of the underwriting process of each lender, whether it's an online uh, platform operator or a bank or a small lender. It's, it's, it's looked at uh, what is the interest expense of the person's uh, other uh, outstanding loans, what is his or hers uh, other expenses to make ends meet. Credit check is being undertaken by at least one 
uh, credit check companies. See if there were any payment problems in the past. There are other outstanding loans. Asset and liability verification. Okay, so you look a little bit about the personal uh, balance sheet of the borrower. If he has a house, if he has a car, if he has other loans. And you make a credit decision, uh, which amounts to yes or no to give him the credit, how much of what he asked for he actually gets, and at what interest rate. Ali. Yeah. <coughs> so all this is done by the platform, or do you have to do it? No, of course this is done by the platform. <laughs> no, so do they do they check this or is it yeah like absolutely a, do they check this it's 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 checked of course when i get to risk specific to crowdfunding investments we're going to talk a little bit about fraud which is of course a big risk right and insufficient verification so these are all out there of course now the collection process you uh, might think that if, a pers if it's a personal loan and it's unsecured by any assets, this of course does not mean that the person can simply walk away and not pay his debt if it's not backed by any asset. <laughs> it's funny because some people think, why would he ever pay back? Of course, there's this little thing called the legal system, and uh, if you, if you don't pay back your loan, you're breach in breach of a contract. But what is the legal system? It's the U.S. system. Or Every country, even third world countries in Africa, have laws that have been... I mean, the, the platform, the lending club, for example... Lending club is under U.S. law, of course. But you have platforms operating in the U.K., and Europe, uh, in Germany, in so each the, and every country, even in the African countries. The legal system countries. is defined by the platform. The legal system is uh, determined by the domiciliation of the borrower. So I should have prepared more on the legal side for you. Actually, I've done a lot of research on how to construct uh, these platforms. There's the, think about this two, there's two legs to it. One leg is the uh, lending. Okay, so there's a loan agreement between the platform and the borrower. And this is a loan agreement. A loan agreement is always between two parties, a borrower and a lender. And this is usually governed by the law of the domiciliation of the borrower. And then this loan gets assigned economically, passed on to the investor. Now the investor could be anywhere in the world and that assignment could be under different law. This assignment agreement could be under different law. So there's two legs to it. And accordingly, sometimes two licenses are required. I'll get to that, I'll, I'll, I'll write it out on the board. Collection process, okay, so account freeze. Certain countries, the law allows a freezing of a borrower's personal bank account, even without court procedures. It's like 60 days of non-payment, bam, your personal bank account's frozen. Collection agency, 60 days non-payment, the case goes to collection agency. Get com they get compensated, usually as a percentage of money collected. Be expected, SMS. Letters, SMS, letters, phone calls. Some countries, personal visits are within the law. Courts. Sometimes it's worthwhile or necessary for the lender to get a court judgment against the borrower. In order to go after the borrower's personal assets, his house, his car, remember, if he has a car, if he has a car, if he has a house or a car, if it's a personal unsecured loan, they are not explicitly pledged as collateral, but it doesn't mean that they're not within reach of the lender in case of default. But the lender does need to go to court and get a judgment to get to these assets. But now notice that even if the house or car are not explicitly pledged as collateral, they are within reach of the lender in case of default. The mortgage lender against the house, if, it's such, if, if there is a house and a mortgage against it, have of course, first priority in getting repaid over this personal unsecured. Personal unsecured is the lowest uh, in the order, in the pecking order. It has the, the lowest priority. Any questions, sir? Uh, <laughs> All of them. 
debt relief. The court will usually evaluate the repayment ability of the borrower and may impose a reduction in the monthly payment duration, extension of duration, reduction in interest rate, any forgiveness in principle. Okay, so once this case goes to court after, after default, everything kind of, kind of opens up. There are uh, in each country different laws and different attitudes towards consumer protection, towards borrower's protection. In each and every country, even in, uh, in, in Africa and third, uh, third world countries, you have laws that date back to the, to the English Empire or the Dutch, or German, wherever um, the, the, the imperialists were. These laws are as old as since forever. There's absolutely nothing new about this process. There's something called a garnish order. Uh, a court may issue a garnish order, it's under the UK common law countries, uh, or uh, telling any current or future employer to deduct a monthly payment to be paid to the lender. Okay, so this is also a possibility for the lender to go after the a garnish order. Interestingly, some of these countries, in Finland, for example, the court allows API access to lenders. So there's no need to begin, if you want to begin proceedings, uh, legal proceedings for, uh, against a defaulting borrower, you don't even need to send a letter or even an email. It's computer to computer. 60 days, it starts. Okay. Any questions so far? I feel you guys have gotten quiet. Are you associating yourself with the borrower? <laughs> <laughs> Expected return, duration, size, and fees. Lending Club is the biggest player, lending at an average interest rate of 13%. The average default rate is 5 The fee is 1 It gives about 7% average net returns. Okay? Fair. There are higher returns out there so by different platforms. When they need to pay 13% on the year, is there a lot of adverse selection? They only get those who don't get the better rate at the bank? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. This is the market. It's a very competitive market. I mean, it's not as competitive as it ought to be, judging by the seemingly excessive returns. Okay, so this is up for uh, any person's opinion, whether these returns are excessive or not. But we have a slide we can talk about this. So how cyclical are the defaults? They are cyclical, of course. Let me show you something. Let me show you this very as a comparison. Okay. Let's jump to this, okay? It's a good time to jump. Uh, so what does personal unsecured is most uh, similar to uh, as far as other assets which we do have data on? So you compare personal unsecured to Credit card debt. So this is U.S. aggregate credit card debt. Uh, what you can see here, the blue up in the blue is the interest rate. <coughs> uh, the green is the net yield, net return after charge-offs. Charge-offs is losses. And you can see that even 2009, 2010, at the height of the Great Recession, the charge-offs uh, brought the net return down, but not even to zero. It was just shy of four percent. This is aggregate U.S. credit card debt. Okay, so if you want to have, put your judgment and say that some of these platforms have a credit underwriting process which is as good as, or even better, uh, than uh, uh, the, the credit card companies, but they seem to be charging a higher interest rate, then it's up to your judgment to decide what the performance is going to be going forward. Duration of personal unsecured varies between 30 days and up to five years. So it's it's perfectly fine for a person to borrow, say, 10,000 euros for a period of four years and pay it back with equal installments every month. Average loan size between $50 and $30,000. So some platforms do lend uh, as low as $50. How do you pay? Any question? So just saying it's a lot of work for $50, right? To do all this information gathering. These guys that do $50 is a friend of mine. It's a different process. 
uh, they do bank scrapping, automatic bank scrapping. So in order to get the loan, uh, so it's really like the bottom, the, the bottom of the barrel. Uh, in the UK, you can go online. Many of these APR can go up to uh, 150, and, and it's usually at the cap uh, determined by the law at 150% APR. And they do bank scrapping to do the credit check because to do a proper credit check is too costly. But they end, but what they do is they ask for the password to their bank account. If you want to borrow money, you have to give us the password to your bank account, and then they automatically log in, they scrap the history, and they see if this person has a gambling problem. And they see where he's paying. If he's had a gambling problem, then no. But he might have many accounts. He might have many accounts. And another major, major, uh, major consideration when, when choosing a platform to work with is the quality of the data. This can really, if you have the eye for returns, uh, a platform which is able to produce um, good data, aggregate data to the investors, should give you some more confidence in uh, the fact that they know what they're doing. Okay, so if you if you're, look at this, chart for example, then how do you read this? Every month there were say 2 million euros uh, being uh, under, underwritten, okay? of which uh, this amount was already paid back because we're now at the end of 2016. Uh, this remains still current and this is overdue. If you look at this kind of hump shape and you've seen say aggregate uh, non-performing loans and the performing loans uh, break down by banks, then it looks kind of similar to this for the banks that know what they're doing, then you should get the confidence that these guys uh, know what they're doing. They have another interesting uh, chart that uh, they set interest rate ex ante with the expectation that some will default and given default, they have some sort of expectation in their mind about what will be the recovery rate over a year and a half that it go that it takes to take people to court and recollect and call that 100 and then uh, they see how they did exposed how much they were able to collect uh, exposed and they compare that to the ex ante expectation as long as it's about 100 percent it means that they're doing better than uh, what they were expecting at the time that they were making the interest rate decision in the credit institution. Any questions about personal loan security before we, we move on? So what is your role in this? In which? In the personal secured loan, is it give the loan or? The, the car that I drove to Vitsna today is a Ferrari. <laughs> I borrowed everything at 18% from this website. That's all okay. you're, you're on the other side. <laughs> no, I am lending. <laughs> Any questions? So do you lend to the platform? Do you lend to individuals? So how does it work? Where's the matching process? So uh, it's platform features. Let's jump into your question. Platform features. You have a feature called Auto Invest. Auto Invest. Uh, that's what I do. So I put my judgment in selecting the platform to work with because I believe that they have a good process and a good track record and potentially they have a license to operate as a credit provider or other license to distribute. Not enough. <laughs> So explain again what is your role in this. So you collect funds that you give to a platform and they distribute it to the lenders? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I select platform to invest in clients. Uh, so then there's a fund called Rappaport Flagship Limited. It's a legal entity domiciled in the British Virgin Islands. It's an offshore private fund. I sell shares in the fund in exchange for cash, 
and this cash is being transferred from the personal account of the investor into the bank account of the fund. It's a bank account under the legal name of the fund. And from there, I take it to all the investment platforms, which again have accounts under the name of the legal entity. Okay, and the investment platform decides on the individual borrowers. Exactly, so this is the auto-invest function. Once I choose a platform to work with, I don't bother with selecting individual borrowers. The auto-invest function would allocate capital to new loans as existing loans are repaid, such that the minimum amount of cash will accumulate in the account. Okay, does the auto does the auto invest make sense to you? Yeah. Gentlemen, I, people are trying to. So is the money which you give to the platform is that secured, or can the platform say you didn't get enough back to get a haircut? Or? Let's uh, let, let, let's try to explain this. I, I feel that we need to go a little bit slower. So it's right, so there's a platform. This is platform operator. It has a bank account, one bank account for the platform. Money goes into the bank account of the platform from investors. Investor one. Investor and and goes out to borrowers. Just like a bank does. <coughs> borrower and borrower. And yeah, just a second. Then say a borrower wants to borrow two thousand five hundred euros on average. I wouldn't invest 2,500 euros in whole in his loan. I would invest simply five euros. And he would get the rest from you and you and this gentleman over there and this gentleman over there. Such that he gets filled up and gets the 2,500 that he needs. And I would therefore get diversified over 2,000 or 3,000 of these borrowers by getting this, a five euro loan slice in each one. This slice thing is done by the platform. They have either a manual function or an automatic function. So the auto-invest function, each one of these platforms has an auto-invest function, then it just <coughs> sends, allocates five, 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 five. Some of them vary in their complexity. Some of the algorithms are literally equal amounts in, in, in every loan that comes on market, and some of them are more sophisticated and have some sort of risk weighting. But why, why do I pick the one to you personally put it in the platform? Why don't I do it directly? I'm sure you charge a fee, right? You, that's a good question. There's, uh, there's several reasons. One is that uh, you can, of course, open it uh, in some of these platforms. Uh, for example, in the US, you're not a US citizen, are you? So, but if you wanted to invest on Lending Club, for example, or another US based uh, platform, you would not be able to. Because the IRS only uh, allows the platforms to take in money either from a U.S. person or from a U.S. company. My fund has a wholly owned subsidiary in the U.S. and thus I can invest money in the U.S. for you. So you get shares in the in the holding company, which owns wholly owns uh, subsidiary. Then I can invest in the U.S. And of course, I have the expertise in choosing the platforms. But then, but then the U.S. will withhold 30% of your interest when you want to send it back to the VR, right? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's not withheld by the platform. Yeah. Uh, but the LLC, the U.S. subsidiary, will have to uh, declare taxes at UN. Yeah. But that's some expenses right. will be allowed to deduct uh, against this income. Sorry? Some expenses yeah, will some be expenses, allowed to yeah. be deducted against the income. Yeah, but you so, have like a straw man and mm -hmm. your, your expenses are a straw man and uh, paying 500 for... Uh, no, I can, I can, the state I, of I can, I can reduce the... Yeah. There is some uncertainty as regards to taxes. Okay. 
but uh, yeah, U.S. taxes. Any income generated in the U.S. is subject to U.S. source income. The fund will withhold 30% of any income generated in the U.S. At year end, uh, I will file for tax, the tax return for the LLC yeah. and deduct as many as expenses as uh, legally allowed. Uh, and then the tax man in the U.S. will determine what the uh, allowed expenses are and therefore what is the taxable income. We will determine the final tax bill and if anything is returned, I will uh, reimburse the investors. And in any case, what tax was withheld uh, will be reported to the investors such that when they file for taxes themselves on the holding in the fund, uh, they will be able to uh, get a credit with the tax authorities in their home country. So there's how many platforms are you using? About 20. 20. Then another, re another reason to invest via the fund is uh, uh, advantage to size. Okay. So in BVI you're treated as partnership? Well, or US uh, we can talk about this later. Yeah. Okay. You can see we're interested in the legal aspects of it. Yes, sir. Specific platforms are you using, or what criteria are you using in choosing the platforms? Right, so I can tell you about the criteria, but I'd like to keep the individual names of the platforms which I worked with as a professional secret. You can respect that. Uh, in counterparty risk management, uh, I'm very much aware that even that each platform allows me to get uh, invested in, in many issues, say 2,000 or 3,000 borrowers for each platform, so I get very much diversified. But of course, I still have the counterparty risk and concentration risk to the platform operator, say Lending Club or other platforms. So I need to choose the platform and I need to choose the allocation for each platform. So what goes into this decision process is their track record, first and foremost, how much cumulative loan volume have they generated? How much volume are they generating per month? How long have they been operating? I'm looking for a proven track record at collecting, and especially a proven track record at collecting non-performing loans. Are you with me? So the, 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 the proven track record of being able to collect on defaulting borrowers is something that I am looking for. I'm looking for platforms which have been battle tested. Quality of the data. How transparent and detailed is the data that they produce to investors? Do they have a license to operate? Okay, if you're lending money in any country, you almost definitely need a money lending license in every country. So the platform, because it lends on this part, is a loan agreement between him and him. They need a license agreement, uh, a license to be a, a money lending license. So there could be different, different uh, shades of this license. If it's a credit provider license, it's one license below a banking license. It's quite a strong uh, license. There's a lot of uh, regulatory uh, requirements that need to be fulfilled. So that's definitely a plus if I'm working with such a platform. Uh, does it have a broker-dealer license? Okay, then on the other side, in order to distribute to clients, to investors, you also need a license. Could be all in one license, credit provider license could be done one license that will encompass both aspects. But sometimes they, they are different licenses with different regulatory authorities, one to lend and one to distribute to investors. Okay, in the US, for example, any distribution of any financial asset is considered sale of securities, fall down, fall, fall down the securities law, okay? Which makes it quite expensive to get the license to distribute in the US. So these 20 platforms are the platforms from which you select, or are there more yep. in the world that you have already selected? There are about 2,400 oh. platforms that I have a very comprehensive list. Okay. And uh, I, have some, I have some clever interns helping me evaluate them. I'm almost done with that process.
Lending Club in particular uh, relies heavily on selling to institutional investors. Do you have any idea how much percent of the money Lending, cl lending, club is a, lending Club is a public company. I'm sure if you Google their annual report, you will get the answer to that. My guess, I haven't looked at their annual statement, but my guess it would be at least 50% is to institutional investors. Any other questions? What's the ratio of invested to committed capital with the Say again? What's sort of the ratio of invested to committed capital with the investment? Invested to committed, what do you mean? Well, you, I mean, you give them, or else, do you pool the money and then you have the money in your pool and only um, the lending club actually delivers this money when someone needs it? Or do you give the money to lending club and lending club distributes the money and never someone needs it? So the, the, the goal is to uh, have uh, zero cash in your account. So unless you can define in some of these to have, say, uh, you can, uh, with the auto invest function, you can tell the auto invest, please reinvest all my money, or invest all my money if it's the first time that I put a deposit, but keep a minimum of $1,000. Why? Because at any point in time, something can happen and I want to be able to withdraw $1,000 quickly, or in anticipation of a cash event that I will need for myself. But uh, I don't keep any cash, I try to keep zero cash. I could try to keep negative cash. And how much like growth have the lending companies had over the past? In years? volume, yeah. amazing, fantastic uh, growth, fastest growing in the financial and industry. So by the volume alone tells me the story of the lending company. That's up to you to evaluate, sir. <laughs> up to you to evaluate. High quality of management. I know some of the some of the management of these platforms individually. Uh, of course, one of the uh, the, the additional uh, advantage is that I do uh, conduct negotiations with some of the platforms. Okay, so how does the platform make its money? Anybody? These platforms need to make money. Of course, they make money on the flow. <coughs> They usually borrow money from the, they, they usually charge money to, to the borrower <laughs> as a fee. But big enough investors uh, dealing with hungry enough uh, platforms looking for growth will be able to get a deal wherein some of the fees charged by the platforms will be forwarded to uh, institutional investors. So yes, you can negotiate to get a better deal. So say expected returns are 7%. But Lending Club charges 1% in fee. Lending Club wouldn't do this, but in this example, if you're big enough, you can tell Lending Club, hey, hey, you're not gonna charge 1%. You're gonna charge 1% and pass on half a percent to me. So you keep half a percent and I get seven and a half percent. Simple enough. The advantage is to size. For the person asking why, why should you do it with me? This is not a sales pitch. I'm really trying to educate you guys. And, uh, but uh, th these are some of the advantages in do it, uh, doing it in a pooled account. Advantages to size. Let's get back to the next asset class. I already have a feeling that we're not gonna have enough time. Real estate bridge loans, okay? So personal unsecured, the fund would invest in the US, in the UK, and in continental and Eastern Europe through different platforms. Similarly, with real estate bridge loans, which I'll explain in a second what they are, the fund invests in the US, the UK, it's very popular, and in Eastern Europe, and some in continental Europe. What's real estate bridge loans? There's been an active market for short-term real estate investments in every major economy for a very long time. This is absolutely nothing new, okay? Real estate entrepreneurs would finance the purchase of a property with a mix of own equity and debt. Fix it up, build it up, with the aim of selling for a profit or refinancing at a cheaper rate after 12 to 24 months. Okay. If any of you comes from a rich, wealthy family that's been doing this for generations and generations, you know what I'm talking about. In case of default, the crowdfunding portal operator will seize the property, sell it, pay back the borrowers. It's a mortgage, it's called the real, real estate bridge loan. 
The short-term real estate market is characterized by a race between entrepreneurs to come up with the capital to buy up good deals on offer by sellers, who in turn are motivated by different reasons. As soon as an attractively priced property is placed in the market, the race is on to get the financing to purchase it, because the profit can be realized by an experienced entrepreneur fairly certainly. Now, if you ask any of these real estate entrepreneurs why they don't get their money from the bank, they laugh at you because obviously you've never had to deal with the banks. Uh, they will tell you. They will tell you. After the small borrower, the banks are simply too slow, arrogant, and inflexible in how they treat small borrowers. Uh, okay. So this is definitely, in my judgment, okay, and you can have a different opinion because there's nothing is a fact in finance, everything is an opinion. In my opinion, uh, these assets seem to be uh, generating excessive returns because they have been generating excessive returns for generations and generations, but only now have been uh, become available to the public. And uh, no, you cannot get easily funds from the bank for anything. So security, the borrower is usually a limited liability company owning the real estate asset. The security agent usually gets a first lien mortgage against the collateral. So in this case, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be direct. There would be the platform would have a legal entity which is uh, listed on a mortgage agreement as having a first lien uh, security on the property. It wouldn't be the investor's individual. Okay. So the security agent operated by, by the platform will take a first lien mortgage against the asset. And in case of default, in case of default, they, they're gonna foreclose. Because this is very popular in the US, in the UK, and some platforms in Eastern continental Europe. Okay. Uh, other assets. Sometimes uh, borrowers will pledge other apartments is collateral. So he's building up one apartment and he will pledge that apartment in addition to another apartment as collateral. In addition to that, there could be a personal guarantee. So in addition to the asset being renovated or flipped, uh, pledged as collateral, a director of the borrower company uh, might offer a personal guarantee. So in case something goes bad, then he's liable for it personally. That, that's quite common. Expected return, duration, size, loan to value, and fees. Net yields after one or three percent fee are eight to twelve percent, with insignificant losses to date. Some of these platforms have been operating since 2009. There have been hardly any default, but of course I choose to work with because uh, with, with, the, with the ones that do have experience in foreclosing. I don't want to, I, I wouldn't work or wouldn't allocate a large amount uh, to a platform which hadn't had, which didn't, which, which didn't have to take a borrower to court and repossess and, and sell, uh, sell this asset, pay back. Because you, you want them to be battle tested, of course. You don't want them to think that they have security over the asset and then have to go to court and not know what they're doing and end up not being able to, to repossess and to sell it. Probably, I don't know whether I checked this point correctly, but let's assume that um, I want to take uh, on a, take on a loan for fifty thousand. Then basically, I would have to pay between eight to twelve percent interest on that loan. Yes. Why would I ever do that if, I, if the bank basically gives me a loan for two percent? The bank doesn't give you a loan for this. The bank wouldn't give you a loan for this. Certainly not at two percent. It would take you about six to 12 months to convince the bank to give you a loan for real estate con construction. It's not for personal occupancy. It's not your house that you live in, the mom and pop that live in the, in the house. And then you get a mortgage. This is, this is real estate development. If you get it from the bank, it'll take you six to 12 months to convince them. And if they give it to you, it'll be a 10 or 12%. It's not, it's not the usual mortgage that you're used to. That you know. 
This is this is this is uh, real estate debt for development bridge loans. Loan to value varies between thirty and seventy five percent. Duration varies between six and thirty six months, but more than half and twelve months. Size varies between fifty and hundred and a million and a half per loan. The biggest risk. The biggest risk, of course, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for for real estate bridge lending, anyone in the business would tell you, is anyone guessing what's the biggest risk when uh, lending against real estate? The biggest risk is, of course, is fraud and inflated uh, valuations of the property. If you think you're lending a 60% loan to value, but actually you're lending 120% loan to value. It just is not worth what it seems. Okay? So this is mitigated, of course, by, uh, by, by the platform's experience and reputation, but cannot be eliminated. Of course, the valuation of an asset is only subject to the surveyor's opinion, and if the platform chooses which surveyor to work with, there are risks, many risks. Okay, the next asset class, how are we doing on time? The next asset class is invoice financing. German is factoring, also in English is factoring. It's been around since a long, long time. Absolutely nothing new about it. Uh, the, uh, how it works is say you're a small supplier with no access to funding. Say you're really a small company and you're struggling to get financing from the bank. You know, banks don't give out the money so easily. They only uh, give it to the big boys that can illustrate a repayment ability. But uh, let's say you were able to sell uh, your product, say a tractor or a component. Uh, it's very common that the payment would be within 30 to 60 days. Okay, so this would fall under due from additional <laughs> clients. So you would, you would you deliver uh, the, the tractor that you've built for this company, but the company would only pay you within 30 or 60 days. But you need the money now. I mean, so you need it or you want it. You can sell the receipt, the due from client receipt to the crowd. You could sell it also for a bank. It's been around since forever. But now you can sell it to the crowd. Uh, the credit risk is with the client, who often is a larger company. I think it's a hypothetical example about a supplier to the great apple. The supplier might sell his invoice at the discount representing 70 10% annualized interest rate to the crowd investors. The crowd purchasers of the invoice will get a 40 day note with underlying risk of the great apple at 7 10% rate, which in this example is clearly risk arbitrage. Okay, again, it's, it's the timing of, it's the, timing of the of the, of the of the capital of the loan provision that, that makes it look pretty because if you're selling due dates if you're selling different client uh, invoices you need it quick it's a 40 days average duration the bank said you don't move that quickly uh, 40, 40 days duration average interest rate is about 10 percent average default rate has been really insignificant fees are two or three percent which are high in my opinion it gives about seven percent average net return but for a very long duration. Okay, size varies between 10,000 and 100,000 per, per invoice. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, let's talk about the last thing, uh, margin loans. This is a bit complicated. talk about risks specific to crowdfunding. Okay, so uh, by far the biggest risk goes without saying is, the, is any kind of uh, borrower default, any kind of lending, the main risk is borrower default. Uh, fraud committed by the borrowers. Personal borrowers can commit fraud by providing fake documents. This is usually preventable. So if someone says he's someone who, who he, is, he isn't, Usually that's kind of preventable, that kind of fraud. Uh, but the most com more, more common is producing fraudulent personal income statements. So you would give a payment slip, change the date, uh, 
whatnot. You could say that you have a higher income to get the loan than you actually do. So that's that's more common. It's not as bad as faking the, the documents and running away the money, uh, which is preventable. Corporations can submit fraudulent financial reports. Okay, so there's there's also small business loans or medium-sized corporate debt. The companies would borrow money either from a bank or online. Absolutely nothing new. All these assets have been have been brokered uh, since forever. But only now become available to investment by by, by retail retail investors online. Corporations can submit fraudulent financial reports. Most corporate borrowers do not even have audited financial reports. So I stay away from this, from, from the medium-sized corporate debt. So th these are medium-sized business, this other assets brokered online. Medium-sized businesses looking to borrow about 250K, which is five to 7%. You have these in every country. I stay away from these. Uh, sub sub segment of the market because the risks seem much higher than listed junk bonds due to the deficiency in financial disclosures and more limited recourse than the online the, that the online lenders have compared with junk bonds which fall under security law uh, yet they provide similar yield to junk bonds so I stay away from medium sized corporate debt especially since they can produce uh, no financial uh, reports or fraudulent financial reports. The biggest risk in the real estate bridge lending is, of course, inflated valuations of the property. Flawed underwriting. Another major risk is that the lending standards that the platform operator will be revealed as having systematic flaws, leading to subpar investment performance. This is mitigated by the platform's track record and experience. Fraud committed by the operator. Okay, so everyone asked about this. This is a big thing that you want to consider as a risk. Even if you have a huge, uh, very diversified uh, allocation to, to, with one platform, with many issues through that one platform, you still uh, have the counterparty risk that that platform can defraud you that bid. Platform operators are non or lightly regulated entities. There is a heightened risk of the platform operator committing fraud and embezzlement. This risk is mitigated by some of the platform operators having a credit provider license or license to distribute what amounts to security under US securities law. This risk is further mitigated by the platform operator having audited financial results. Some of them do, like the one, the big four. Some of the platforms have to uh, do uh, take a slice in every loan. So they must have skin in the game according to some regulation. Operator default. Okay, if a platform operator defaults for any reason, several additional risks may materialize. Operators have separated accounts for clients' monies and their own money, okay, such that the clients' monies do not form part of the operator's assets and need not be available to the operator's creditors in the event of the operator's insolvency. Does that make sense to you guys? It's like the securities you have in the bank. If the bank goes default, the securities are usually bankruptcy removed. They're not on balance sheet with, with the bank. So similarly, the money that you have invested via the platform is separate from the money of the platform itself, which is if the, the platform goes bankrupt, your assets are segregated. But Can still, you yep. Tell us something about your fund. How much assets do you have on the management? What is the track record? Here's the performance, January 1st, 2015. Okay, so I just launched the fund. I've been taking the external investors January 1st, 2017, and uh, I have about three million in commitments from uh, friends and colleagues. This is the performance based on a consolidated view of my personal accounts. It's unaudited, it's not be construed as investment advice or a solicitation to buy any securities. This is the performance, and this is MSCI World. Of course, the fund invests in everything. So I invest not only in crowdfunding deals, but I invest also in public securities. So it's really, when you go to the supermarket, you don't usually get a slice of salami, slice of ham, some vegetables, some fruits, some tuna bread, and everything, and cheese, and mix it together. That doesn't make for a nice meal. 
not nearly a nicer meal as we've had here, thanks to Toasty. But when investing, I do feel that that's the right approach to mix everything together. So you can call this a everything in it fund. I have a passive allocation to stocks globally, basically MSCI world. Uh, passive allocation to global uh, corporate debt, both investment grade and junk grade globally. And a passive investment for Gavi bonds, mostly in the US, mostly long dated. I did take a big, bit of a hit on those when Trump got elected, but of course that was compensated with stocks going up. And these are the uh, crowdfunded assets. And this is not the exact allocation that I have, but just for example, some personal loans, some smaller personal loans, margin loans, which I haven't explained to you. Real estate debt is a big allocation. Real estate equity, actually, I don't hold any. Uh, invoice financing is a, is a big allocation. Some car loans that I can invest in, some aircraft loan that I can invest in, some agro loans. Agro loans is an interesting uh, asset. So what happened there in August, October 16th? Well, this, this is a big story. <laughs> I really hope to write one day a, a, a case study for this, for, uh, for, one, of, for one of the U.S. universities, for one of the U.S. business schools, because what happened is uh, really an amazing story. But uh, I need about 15 minutes to tell that story. You do this when you're afraid. I do it when you're afraid. <laughs> Any questions? So in 15, you have been clever. 1915? Yeah. 2002. Mm -hmm. No, it's up 10%. Not very much, no. And then what changed in 2015? Uh, yeah. uh, so you see, you see it widening, you see it widening up relative to MSCI world. That's a lot is the allocation to uh, U.S. government bonds, long dated. Okay, so U.S. government bonds are rallying while the stock market was kind of going down. And of course the allocation to uh, the loans, which give me uh, a really nice uh, return. So that's kind of been opening up in 2015. And then the big run up is, uh, uh, is, is, the, is, is the rising price of Bitcoin. 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 So you are invested directly into Bitcoin and into the stock. Uh, Both. <laughs> now it, 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 it does uh, take quite a while to convince you that, that Bitcoins uh, are a good investment. I see there's some skeptics in the crowd. Uh, but I don't just, uh, one, just the one point that I want to give is that I don't simply hold Bitcoins outright. I hold assets denominated in Bitcoin. I lend the Bitcoins, and there is a margin uh, mechanism to make sure that the loan is safe. And I get an interest rate of between 5 and 10% on the Bitcoins. It's, uh, it's a bit, that would take another 10, 15 minutes to explain the margin. It's a bit more complicated. I'd love to explain to you after the break, sir. Yeah. About your crowdfunding strategy, do you think this will be sustainable? Well, you have to realize that uh, these are not traded instruments, okay? Just from a market perspective. So the market takes quite a while to, uh, to, to, to deteriorate in the quality. So interest, you don't see interest rates going down yet. You don't see interest rates going down yet. And some of these platforms, they have excessive demand for loans. So not enough investors. So they give special deals to investors. Come invest with us, we'll give you a special deal if you're an institution. So the situation might be In my opinion, this is very uh, much an opinion. Nobody can say what will happen in the future, whether these will be continued to provide what seems to be excessive returns or not. Do you think in my field there are more people who feel smaller and easier to business models to extend the game? So that at the end, maybe at land and crop, people don't have 50% because some people still land it, but maybe 90%. 
this is speculation. I would say that yes, this is growing. I've just told it to all of you that I do expect this to grow. This is the highest growing uh, sub-segment in the financial industry. How is it positive in the past? Do you see any change happening concerning futures rates? No. Interest rates have remained at what they were in the past five, six years, I'd say. So even the more money goes into that, the interest rate doesn't go down. It could be that the credit quality is deteriorating, but you don't see the interest rate going down. In what jurisdictions are you investing this trust fund? Everywhere in the world. The US, the UK, continental Europe, and Eastern Europe. I stay away from the Chinese. Okay, okay, because uh, I know some EU investors in, in China and they have a huge problem with fraud because in China you can uh, uh, if you do real, if you do a development of a real estate project, they have some problems where the project doesn't even like the bills. So, so they the only joke I have about the Chinese uh, taking investments from foreigners is is that they love equity investment because you never have to pay it back. <laughs> So what is what is your current allocation to future problems? So I have about 20 20 20 percent in Bitcoin. Twenty percent. And I guess my house is like a few. So if you but I make it between five and ten percent on my bitcoins. So it's a Bitcoin denominated short-term asset. So with the margin mechanism. So